First of all, we have Nagla, and hands up those of you who are currently teaching in a department school. Just so we've got an idea. So that's, that's pretty good. Nagla and I were just chatting and I actually indicated to her that um, the last two years we've had this conference in a, and it's corresponded with a school holiday. And of course this year it's still term time and you guys have all got your classes back at school and you've had to prepare lessons and leave it. You've had to get permission from the principal to come. And I've had quite a few emails from people saying that their principal said no, they couldn't come. Um, so I've made a decision that going forward, um, I'd like to continue these conferences, but I'll probably make sure that they are in school holidays and, or they're on a Saturday. Now I know that won't suit everyone because people want to go away with their children and all that sort of stuff and I get that, I understand that, but I think probably that's going to be the best strategy for most people and you'll come when you can, yeah. Okay, so Nagla works for the department in a very important role. How many of you have met her before or seen her present? Excellent, so quite a few people. Um, and I think some of the, who were the MTeach people who saw Nagla present? There was a few of you, yeah, okay. So Nagla will be talking a little bit more about some of the things she shared with you. But, um, you know, think about your questions and, and jot them down and hopefully we'll have an opportunity for some questions at the end. Um, okay, I'm going to hand over to you rather Thank than take you. up any more time. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Oh, it's lovely to be here today. It's great to see such a wonderful crowd as well. So many mathematicians in one room. It's just enormous. Beautiful. Okay, so I'm the numeracy advisor for the Department of Education and Training, uh, 7 to 12. So there is another numeracy advisor that works with me, K to 6. We have uh, maths advisors as well, K to 6 and 7 to 12. We all live in Oxford Street, um, in a, a little tower in Oxford Street, and basically any state initiatives for mathematics and numeracy. Um, any programs, professional learning, funding that goes out to school comes through us. Um, on top of that, ministerials, correspondence for Parliament and for the Minister, we do as well. We do a lot of the STEM work, so I do a lot of work with Judy as well, just collaborating and, and sharing what we do. Um, a lot of the work I do is available to everyone, not just department schools. You may have noticed our numeracy skills framework is not behind the firewall. No one at the department has discovered that yet. I will get in trouble. <laughs> but while no one's noticed, it's not going behind the firewall because I do believe we all need to share, help each other, support each other um, and really get the best learning outcomes for these students. Okay, so at any point, please ask me questions. It's not a formal presentation. It really is very easy. I am a maths teacher, high school maths teacher. I love my mathematics. Eddie just asked me how long have you been out of the classroom. I said longer than I wish to want to be out of the classroom. It's the longest I've been out. Um, this is my third year. Normally I jump out for two years. I do whatever the department needs me to do. I go back to school. So, and it's usually implementing new syllabuses or doing stuff like this for the numeracy skills framework, etc. So my number one passion is in schools with my students. A lot of my students are maths teachers. Um, on top of being, I've got engineers, architects, uh, we've got dentistry, medicine, um, all sorts of things, retail, business, head of Zara, all sorts of things. So I love walking through the city now because I do bump into my teacher, in my ex-students, and they're all just doing amazing things. They've always had a passion for maths. And I think if you are an awesome maths teacher, which I think everybody in this room probably is, um, you're here today, you're inspired, you're motivated, you want to make a difference, you'll never be forgotten. Okay, so let's start. What is numeracy? So to be numerate is to use mathematical ideas effectively participate in daily life and make sense of the world. Now, we worry about numeracy from preschool all the way to adulthood, okay? Um, and in terms of numeracy, our K-12 policy um, is available on the intranet, but it is very basic and very simple. We need to support numeracy through all the KLAs um, in schools, through all the programming and the extracurricular curriculum programs that we run. So it is very important, every school has to follow the numeracy K-12 policy, there isn't a choice. Um, it incorporates the use of numerical, spatial, graphical, statistical and algebraic concepts and skills in a variety of contexts, and that's the key word there, and involves the critical evaluation, interpretation, application and communication, mathematical information in a range of practical situations. 
hands up if anybody's been asked to be on the numeracy team or lead a numeracy team or be part of creating numeracy activities in your school. Straight away, they go to the maths people. Okay, hands up if you've seen the numeracy skills framework or you got a copy when you're in your school. Well, it's not very many. Feel free to email me and I'll send you a copy if you don't have a copy. So I think, oh, I didn't put my email address, but it's just that with a dot in the middle um, at det.newsouthwales.edu.au or you can email Judy and she can let me know and I'll make sure you get a copy for yourself. We did produce about 100,000 and distribute them to schools. Um, so they've gone everywhere, which is really good. Okay, so numeracy is everybody's responsibilities. It comes up as a general capability in the New South Wales syllabuses. It is very important. It's the heart of everything we do. So literacy and numeracy is the backbone of everything. And then when you go into your subject areas, that gives you a context. It gives you an application. It gives you um, different strategies and ways it's used in real life. So numeracy really is very, very important. It comes up as a little calculator in our New South Wales um, syllabus, which is really lovely. It doesn't actually come up in the maths syllabus, but it comes up in every other syllabus, even though it really is about application. Okay, so why did we create the numeracy skills framework? No one would wish this upon themselves, Eddie, why I have to go back to school. Um, but really, it was I listened to teachers. I was receiving email after email of, you know, we're trying to use the numeracy continuum in a high school. It's not quite working. We're trying to use the numeracy continuum in year nine for HISI or for, you know, PDHP. And we can do some of the number stuff, but then when we hit the statistics, etc., there's nothing there to support us. So after the tons of phone calls and emails that I answered, I actually went through and decided we need a framework for numeracy. It needs to be preschool to year 10. I didn't want to go to stage six. I just stopped there um, because I do have a life. Um, but basically, when we created this, we had to liaise with schools, consult with schools, executive principals, senior executives, every curriculum advisor available in New South Wales, and really get together a framework that's thorough, that runs across all stages, early in a stage, late in a stage, and for every single syllabus. So teachers were really happy when they knew we were making this, and couldn't actually wait till it was released. Um, so we had to sort of step on it and, and, and get moving, um, and we were really happy with the results. So we did use the ACARA numeracy continuum. We used the numeracy continuum K to 10. The numeracy continuum K to 10 is a subset of this framework. Because it covers number and place value, it only takes you up to a certain level with the learning progression for students in numeracy. But then it sort of stops. And for me, the problem for high schools, it's fabulous in the primary schools, um, it's fabulous in the early years of high school when you're working with some of the students who haven't quite grasped those concepts yet, but then it moves on, okay? And it needs to move across and it needs to move down through the strands. So we looked at all the syllabuses, history, English, science, technology, creative arts, TAS, and we pulled out all the numeracy skills that are required for every single syllabus to be <coughs> successful when you engage in that content at every stage of development. And I probably the nicest one I had to look at was the early years framework for preschool, and that was just beautiful. Um, and, and we went all the way through to year 10. So it provides teachers with the numeracy skills required by students at every stage of development across every single syllabus. It supports the integration of numeracy across the curriculum. So at the bottom of it, and I'll show you in a minute, um, we have, have applications in languages and applications in PDHPE and um, science, etc. It allows teachers to identify sets of skills for numeracy at each stage, and it helps you assess prior knowledge. If, if you're about to go in and you're gonna teach um, stage four PDHPE and you, you need to do some statistics and they haven't quite done it yet in maths, you go up to this framework and you can see the skills that have, they've acquired or they should have sort of um, accessed in stage three, the skills they should have in stage four. You can assess the prior knowledge Create your activities, make sure you've, you've actually tackled and explicitly taught any skills they need um, and build on there from that point. So it just gives you a really nice progression of all the skills you need from there. Um, it also has a lot of information for strategies um, to unpack different um, numeracy problems, graphs, tables, charts, interpreting data, um, and inf information to help you differentiate as well your lessons in numeracy. There's lots of research to back this and it's all in there as well. I think the biggest thing for us is that, is that numeracy is everybody's responsibility. Um, 
And really, the key to successfully addressing numeracy is first, teachers need to understand the mathematical demands of their subject area. Then they need to work out where the kids are at. So if you're about to teach something and it needs quite sophisticated numeracy skills, and you work out, you've assessed your kids from the framework and you find that they're just here with these skills, well, you need to do the explicit teaching to get them to where you want them to be with that skill so they can engage in your curriculum content successfully and understand it. Okay, so that was the big thing, that gap between where our kids are at and where the level of the content I'm about to deliver. So I've spent my holidays planning this project, I know exactly what my lessons are going to be, the kids walk in and you find out, oh my god, they can't even draw a column graph. Well, they need to be able to understand statistics to do this problem, etc. So you have to go back and do it. But if you just go ahead, full steam ahead with your plans of what you're about to teach and don't take into account where the kids are at before you start, well, they're not going to be very successful with that lesson. So that's the big thing there. And I think though the majority of the responsibility um, of enhancing students' mathematical skills lies in your hands, the mathematics teachers, it is also every other teacher's responsibility to use application of those skills in their curriculum area. Really, really important. It's a whole school focus and it needs whole school attention. And most schools focus the literacy and when you say numeracy, they all get scared. They all get worried and they'll turn to you and you need to help them along the way and do what you can to support teachers. Okay, so the framework. We have five focus areas, mental computation, numerical reasoning, patterns and algebraic reasoning, spatial visualisation, geometric reasoning and mapping, um, measurement and time calculations, and graphical representations and data analysis. Once we split up our five uh, focus areas, and it actually took us two years to create this document, um, we then split it up into the aspects of numeracy. Um, we looked at the Australian Core Skills Framework as well when we did this. We looked at every possible numeracy, um, whatever, continuum, document, whatever that was produced to make sure we incorporated everything. And these are the aspects we came down with to cover all the content that's in all the syllabuses. You know, it's things from understanding mathematical information in texts and tasks. That's really important in numeracy. That's a skill, and I need to be able to make sure I'm teaching to that and assessing that. Um, applying whole number, estimating and problem solving, you know, your normal four sort of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, etc. Understanding fractions, decimals, percentages, rates and ratio, but then there was understanding money and finance. And there was lots of KLA um, applications to that. If you go across to say, um, uh, aspect number three, we had applying concepts of 3D objects, 2D objects, angles and geometry, but then there was position maps, grid reference, right? These are really, really important in the other syllabuses. Um, go across to five, interpreting, analysing data, representing data in graphs and timelines, interpreting chance events and probability. Now for a maths teacher, you look at this and this is just your bread and butter, right? It's not a problem. But for other teachers, it was difficult for them to see the numeracy skills within what they're doing. So this helped to break it down for them a little bit. Okay, so basically the skills are listed so that we cover all schooling from preschool to year 10. Uh, very easy, very simple, plain English. So I've got schools who are using this for their reporting comments because they found it a lot easier to have that plain English. Um, only because the outcome in the syllabus is so broad and quite an umbrella and it covers so many things, they found that this language was easier for them to use. Okay, so when you look at the actual um, framework, and I'll just jot around to the framework first. This is the digital version that we created, um, and you will have, you, you can go through and have a look. There's videos to unpack what the framework's about. We've got videos from different teachers talking about how they embed numeracy in their schools. So I want you to see Elise. Elise is um, Dulwich Hill High School. She's a busy teacher. My name is Elise Anila. I teach at a comprehensive and arts and design stream school called Dulwich High School of Visual Arts and Design. I teach HSIE, so Commerce, History and Geography. All of those subjects require us to use and implement numeracy strategies for students to meet the outcomes of those courses. And we have implemented a range of strategies in order to address that. We also have 43% of our students um, in ESB, so we need to address their needs as well. 
Embedding numeracy into our teaching programs and lesson activities has been a bit of a challenge for us. We started from a top-down approach with our executive, our senior executive, um, addressing our head teachers, and from there, our head teachers took um, instructions to our KLAs and asked us to try to work out ways that we can address the problems that we have, particularly to our KLAs. In HSIE, we discovered that there were quite a few problems with students being able to use comparative language to read tables, to understand equivalents in terms of decimals, percentages, and fractions, and in a general sense, the way that they're supposed to take data and analyze that for the context of geography or commerce or history. In order to develop our strategies for addressing numeracy, we started with our NAPLAN data. We had a professional development day uh, earlier in the year where we looked at the different strategies that are supposed to be specific to NAPLAN and the way that our students are missing out on those across our KLAs. From there, we extracted what was important to HSIE and we used that in combination with the syllabus material, support material that's relevant to our KLA. In HSIE, the biggest issues that we found with students is that they don't know how to differentiate between the skills and applying those skills. They don't know how to construct or collect or record data and then analyse that data separately. There seems to be one big challenge in terms of analysing data and presenting that to us, especially in formal assessment. So the biggest issue that we have is that we need to differentiate between skills and then applying and using those skills at a later date. Specific areas that we needed to address in terms of numeracy included recording and collecting information that students could later analyse and also looking at and interpreting, analysing, synthesising information, particularly from graphs, line graphs specifically, especially in geography where we look at trends over time, issues are related to global inequality and so forth. We also had to address the demands of students understanding and being able to relate between different equivalents, so using decimals, changing up, using, using fractions, using percentages, all within a few minutes of one another. In order to address those needs, we developed specific uh, activities and lessons that were related to each one of those skill sets. Teachers, by all times, were required to focus on language, the language of using um, comparative or evaluative terms and phrases so that students could then articulate what it is that they are seeing. And the students themselves were focused on the collection, recording and construction of data. We believed that if they had that step in between, where they had developed a concept and understanding of a concept, and then had, had to analyse it. If we had a step in between where students were constructing or collecting their own data, we felt they were better prepared to then go on and analyse in more depth. One activity that we developed in terms of addressing numeracy in history and geography was looking at the way that students locate, select and organise information. We found that it was incredibly difficult for students to locate the information that was relevant to the task that we had handed them. And then we found it was even more difficult for them to analyse and interpret that information for a specific purpose. So we have an activity where students are asked to analyse the difference between um, a young kid in a poor country, in a developing country, and uh, an adolescent in a developed country. And what they have to do is use data to explain how their lives are different and how global inequalities exist across the world. So what we did was, in, in keeping with the theme of asking students to collect and construct their own data, we looked into using Google Public Data, which is an online collection of the World Bank and a few other resources. And what they do is uh, create graphs as you click on different parameters. So if we wanted to look at um, freshwater use in Norway versus freshwater use in Kenya, we could select the specific countries, select that um, targeted piece of information, and that graph would appear. And as we would change um, age groups or change countries, the graphs would change with us. And as students saw that happen physically, they were then more able to take that information into their assessment and be better organised in terms of um, addressing the trends and changes over time in those countries. The results of that activity showed us that students um, really had a deep knowledge and deep understanding of that information. They were able to take that information, analyse it, synthesise it, interpret it on a whole new level than we had expected of them before. So what we found was that specifically language um, and phrases like compared to Norway or on the other hand or um, if Kenya had used this X amount of fresh water they would develop this certain type of society. We, we saw students understanding the connection and relationship between those countries and between the data sets 
and that came through all of the you know, the conjunctions, the connect, uh, connectives, and the comparative language that we found in their written work. One example of our use of Google public data involved using World Bank indicators, and we started with economic indicators because we felt that was easiest for students to understand in terms of comparison, you know, how much money does Australia generate, how much money does another country generate. So we started with GDP, and we started with a developing country. I wanted students to see that progress can be made in a country without talking about any relativity to other nations. So we looked at Lebanon as an example, and we found that their GDP was about $40 billion. And the graph itself went up to $40 billion. What we then did was add Australia. And once you add Australia, the graph scale has to change. And as it changes, the Lebanon GDP really dips, and the Australia GDP that sh shows up as $1 trillion really dwarfs it. So students are shocked by that outcome and they just think, how is this data working? So then what we do is we add another layer, we add the US, their GDP is about $16 trillion. And so what happens is, again, that line of Australia is dwarfed along with the Lebanon line. So what we're showing is that data can change, things are relative, that we need to use comparative and a comparative and evaluative language in order to address that data as it shows. We specifically found that in his year, students were struggling with reading and interpreting graphs both of those skill sets, not you know one or the other. We found that students also couldn't calculate fractions, decimals, or percentages, or the equivalence between them, and how to jump from one to another, which again is something that we need in HSIE. We also found that students could not understand and apply scale, and that was specifically important to history in terms of understanding timelines and changes over time. So all of those skills are related to understanding continuity and change, which are important themes of history and geography. The way that we decided to address the nature of using scales and addressing timelines in HISI was by implementing some of the content of Big History, which is an initiative um, pioneered by Macquarie University and backed by Bill Gates. And it's all about understanding global history and universal history as a one phenomenon and looking at cross-curricular links between them and interdisciplinary links. So we're hoping that as students understand that wider scale, that they'll be able to apply that even in history, in geography, in science, and in other KLAs. And you can see there that, you know, it wasn't easy what Elise was doing, and um, it was all about the strategies she was using. It wasn't about the right and wrong answer. It was about what strategies can kids use to actually see things, to understand things, to apply things. So when you're in your classrooms, when you're teaching, when you're helping other teachers embed their numeracy, it really is about those visuals um, and making it very real for students and bringing that mathematics and the numeracy out of the textbooks, out of the page. It has to jump to life. And if you can't bring it to life, then you need to go home. It's really, really important because the textbooks are there, everything's in the pages, but, you know, the kid walks in, opens the book, it's just another book. Like, the hour before, they were doing the same thing with another book, okay? So, you really need to bring the mathematics and the numeracy to life. And I think we are so fortunate these days, because we have things like Google, public docs, and all sorts of things that we can use um, to help our kids really be able to see what's happening. Now, when you move, um, when you move along this framework, you'll find many, many things. So, I'll just take you back to the introduction. You've got your focus areas across the top, really easy to navigate. Once you go in there, you've got your stages, so you can go across to whatever stage you need, say stage four. You scroll through, you can see the collection and the sets of skills. Yep. Um, that video uh, gave me an idea. I'm yeah. wondering, um, since you, you would uh, probably get queries from teachers as to how to, how to implement certain things. Yes. Do, do many of those queries fall into the category of teachers wanting to implement something that's perhaps cross-curricular and yes. not knowing how to do it in one advice room? Yes. How many are there? How many teachers? For cross-curricular? Like I've worked with a lot of teachers for cross-curricular. Um, so just lately, like one of our main a lot of them like to do it just with two subjects because it's a little bit easier for them um, but the last project I did I think we worked with 150 teachers or close to 200 teachers just doing cross-curricular um, units of working stage four so yeah that happens a lot because it, it brings meaning it just brings meaning to the mathematics so if I can sit with a science teacher and do the maths with the science teacher and we bring it to life you know, why would you hit it separately and then the kid goes into math and the kid goes into science? You're learning the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. But in an application, well, now I really understand it. Yes, no, why do those teachers get angry at maths 
strangers? <laughs> no, they're really good. They actually work together really nicely because they valued what the maths teacher knew and wanted to, what they didn't know is when we teach things. Um, so it was more, what's our scope and sequence look like next to theirs? So if you're year seven, you're going straight into science, you're going to boil water and start plotting data and doing line graphs. Well, really, we weren't doing line graphs till later on in year seven, even beginning of year eight. Um, so we needed to have those conversations and those conversations are really, really important. Yeah, be a part of them, put your hand up, it's not too hard on top of what you're doing. Um, it, you really do magic for the place. So it, it, you get the sets of skills. Um, there's this lovely function here which is make a list and you can click whatever you want. So I've got early stage four kids and we're doing graphs and I want a list of all the skills that they're doing. I just go through and click. There's my English application, there's my geography application where I can use it in PDHP and in science. So those skills above are applied in those areas, in those KLAs. So that helps teachers a lot. Once you get to the top, I go to my list and anything I've clicked is there for me to then either print or copy and paste and email to myself, whatever I want. So I can extract what I like. It also has the function of a chart at the end. So I can just select straight down or across what I need um, to support what I'm doing for my teaching and my programming. The book looks like that. I don't know, I think 100,000 copies went out, something like that, um, maybe a little bit more. But it was a big investment for um, our director and she was really happy with it. Um, and the, the feedback from, from schools was really good. Lots of videos to watch in the science classroom, primary classroom, hizzy, etc. Contacts, there's my email down here. If you want a copy, just email me and I'll pop it in the post. Um, if it's one copy, it's easy for me to pop in the post if it's like school sets. You can order them through me, you just have to uh, pay the courier fee. That's the only thing. They do that separately. Okay, so what is numeracy? We go through teacher's role, which you understand. The quality teaching framework, where it lies in the syllabuses. And then the research. And the research is really important. So we took two pieces of research. The first one is cognitively guided instruction. And that's the basis of what we do for the numeracy continuum. And it's the basis of what we do here. And we looked at some studies down at, um, that were done at Macquarie University <coughs> where they really improved marks. And I must say with Hizzy, with Elise, the marks improved, not the marks, just it was the marks, it was the grades, and it was just the conversations and the writing of these kids. The way they were communicating mathematically was amazing. So she showed me the first um, assignments that came in for Hizzy and then the next lot after we did all this work with them. And it, the, the kids just did so well. It was amazing. Um, so we looked at some of the strategies behind it all. And this is one, um, and I know a lot of you would be very familiar with, but this worked really well where you identify areas as teachers. Where do you think the kids are going to go wrong with this? You know, What is it that the kids always do wrong? You as a maths teacher already know. You've already started teaching. The kids always get this wrong. The kids always do this. They never see this properly. So what they did is they gave them a set of um, questions that were mapped back to topics and tasks and assessments to identify the concepts where potential problems may exist. They then pre-tested the students. They took the answers um, and they interviewed the students. They asked them, why did you do it this way? Why did you do this that way? So they've made a, an incorrect answer, but instead of just taking it as yes, no, correct, incorrect, they interviewed the students to try to work out what the learning path was, what they were trying to do and why they took that path. From there, they collated the findings and they actually sat and looked at the misconceptions and they had little teacher workshops. So the teacher workshops were great. So they all decided, these are the misconceptions we've picked up. We've asked kids why they do this. We've got the information. Now, in our teaching, we need to change this, this, this and that. And as a collective group, this is what the teachers did. So um, they then went out and taught their lessons after having their little workshop together and they were all decided they're going to explicitly identify the areas of common misconceptions and address them, okay? Um, including the level of prior knowledge the kids bring to the classroom. So they did lots of that pre-assessment to make sure those basic skills you need are really strong. They modified the lessons, they retaught them, teachers observed each other, etc. and then they did the post-test and the kids did substantially well, really, really well. And I had um, some teachers in America using this as well who sent back an email thanking the researcher because yeah, did so well. The second um, research is Marilyn Goo's research and that was from Queensland, I think it was Queensland University. So what she's come up with is this, the 21st century numeracy model. And she's come up with uh, five elements or areas that you look at. So mathematical knowledge, 
which is the mathematical concepts, skills, problem solving strategies, estimation capacities. Contexts, so context within school and beyond. Disposition, so the confidence or the willingness to use mathematical approaches to engage in different tasks um, and be a bit adaptive and a bit sort of risk taking and flexible. Um, and then tools. So what tools are kids using? Materials, instruments, IT, etc. And critical orientation. So it's that mathematical information you need to make decisions, judgments, reasoning, okay, um, to support your arguments. And teachers use this as a model to take an existing lesson and transform it, transform it to something that had lots of numeracy embedded. And this is what they come up with. So this is a, a, a basic PDHPE lesson. The student wears a pedometer. Um, each student records the number of steps they took over a week. The data is collected in a table. The teacher shows them how to convert it on the board, um, steps to kilometres. Um, then they draw a bar graph showing the kilometres walked per day. And then the kids sort of complete the activity in the book. That was the existing lesson. So when they mapped it to this tool and had a look at where they could inject a, little, a few numeracy moments, this is what it became. And it became that the teacher took the students outside where they estimate a distance of 100 metres first. Then they measured the 100 metres and the students compare their estimate with the actual distance. They then walk the distance, count the number of steps. The teacher then asked the questions to students about how to convert steps to kilometres. So kids tried it and have it, had a go and then she did an example on the board. They then used Excel spreadsheets to actually collect the data each day and the chart wizard in Excel to generate the graphs. Then the discussion started. The teacher and student discussions about data, results, what had taken place, what was meaningful data, what wasn't. Um, and after modelling the procedure, students complete their own conversions, compare the results and display everything on Excel, um, etc. But you can see how a very simple existing lesson can be adapted and all the numeracy is sort of addressed. So they're two really, really strong research methods that I suggest you, you look at and, and have a look at. And it works for your mathematics, works for any KLA. You heard Elise talking about the steps they took to embed numeracy, and they're the same. Know the numeracy demands in your KLA first. So when I did this, I did this with about 50 schools. We sit, here's you sit together, TAS sit together, English sit together. We're in PD, staff development day, um, in the common room, everyone's got butcher's paper. Tell me now, where does year seven have difficulty with numeracy in math, in music, in TAS, in English, in history? And everyone jotted their stuff down. We put them on the board and they all reported back. What do you think they said? What were the main things that the kids were struggling with? You know. I know you know. Conversion. Conversions. What else? Measurement. Measurement. Scale. Scale. Percentages. Percentages, yes. And what's connected to percentages? Fractions. Fractions, Fractions. decimals. Estimation. It wasn't rocket science. Estimation. It was the same, it was the language of mathematics. It was the same thing coming up. But what was happening, each teacher is teaching in isolation. We're all teaching the same kid. So that same kid comes to me in maths, goes to science, goes to his, same child. But I'm not sitting there having a conversation with the other teachers about that child and their learning abilities and where they're at. Doesn't make sense. I'm sitting in my little maths silo, I'm very happy in my maths world, but why aren't we having those conversations? So what we had to do was change our maths faculty meetings to a meeting about seven red. So now I want to meet with all the teachers of Seven Red and I want to discuss the students in the class and then how the curriculum works and how we're teaching them. And that was very, very powerful. Okay? So that was a transformation that made a big difference. We looked at our NAPLAN data. All the schools, they picked say, three areas to focus on. Everyone's focusing on it in the different KLAs. And then, of course, you can use the framework. There's lots of little templates and stuff that you can use to help you. As you go through, um, there's lots of links for primary, and the big thing that's important for you is assessment resources. These are the diagnostic tasks. You can download them. They're diagnostics for stage three, four, five is at the desktop publishers at the moment and will be released soon. About oh, 100,000 of these got distributed to schools as well. Another 6,000 got downloaded off the website in the last eight weeks. There's answers and there's creative maths tasks that you can download as well. All you have to do is Google numeracyskills.com.au. We have transition programs, so we've got schools working in communities of schools. We've got Jackie here, she's in one of our communities of schools working with other primary schools to develop maths transition programs um, and implement them so you can download them and have a look. We've got online professional learning that you can access to for numeracy. And then this, this is the Mathematical Bridge and it's a newsletter, there were five issues created which help bridge the gap between stage three and stage four. Lots of teaching ideas, 
Um, lots of just some great stuff, places to go, things to watch, just to help you with your teaching as well and to help you with what you're doing. And I think it's really, really important that, you know, if you get a chance, have a look at these and there's some great ideas in there for you too. So you've got lots of support there um, and you're welcome to contact me at any time. And just in addition to that, there's little videos. I've got to tell you about the videos. So you can actually see the student demonstrating the skill. So you can look at this in your own time. But it's great for discussions in the staff room. Yeah, don't look at me. But, you know, it was very embarrassing, but it had to be done. But the, they're actually demonstrating the skill that's just, uh, just above it. Okay, so you feel that little play sign as well. And we were looking at decimals and the issues with decimals with these kids. Um, and I'll leave it there because we have to wind that up. But feel free to go there and if you want a copy of it, just give me a buzz. Happy to um, pass it over at any point. Thanks. 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 Thanks.